Well, God is good. Good morning, everybody. Welcome here. I hope you are anticipating to hear from the Lord. I am. I've got a big subject, big topic today. I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 21. We had a scripture reading from Revelation 11, 18, and then I, I gave uh, a second one, so we'd have two. Because both of these verses really, really tie into what's happening in our world. This world is full of problems. I think we all know that. I, I'm assuming that uh, hopefully all of us are looking forward to heaven. Heaven is going to be a wonderful place. There's not going to be any of the problems that we have down here. It's just going to be unbelievable. We're going to be pinching ourselves when we get there, that we're really there. And so today I want to talk to you about some of the signs of the times, one of the biggest, hottest, most controversial topics that uh, is in the news just about every day and how it ties in with prophecy. My title there you can see on the screen behind me is called Climate Change and the Mark of the Beast. How many of you have heard of climate change? Have you heard of that? Okay, just about everybody. And I'd like to read this verse again in Luke chapter 21, verses 25 to 28, and then we can pray. And ask the Lord to bless us. We're recording these, and who knows where they'll go. We hope that they will go out all around the world, that people will watch and listen, be warned, and be blessed. 2125. I'm reading from the what's called the King James Easy Reader Bible, very similar to the King James. It said, Jesus said, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth, what would be happening? Distress of nations. That's right. Distress sounds like stress. Stress among the nations. And then it says, with perplexity. And the word perplexity in the Greek essentially means with no way out. In other words, the problems of this world are going to be so, so great that there is no earthly solution. There's no way out. The sea and the waves roaring, which sound to me like uh, big tsunamis from earthquakes. And then it says men's hearts will be failing them for fear, and my Bible says, and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. So Jesus pinpoints a time when the people of the earth are able to look at the things that are coming upon the earth. And to me, that sounds just like our, our time. That sounds like a high-tech time when through satellite and television and the internet and the news reports that go all around the world, People can look at the things that are coming upon the earth. See that? And that's what's happening now. And then they're, you know, they're scared. People are scared because things are getting worse. And then it says the powers of heaven will be shaken. Even the atmosphere is going to be affected. And Jesus tells us in verse 27 what these things are all pointing toward. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look not just at the things that are coming upon the earth, but where are we to be looking? Looking up. That's right. And lift up your heads for your redemption is drawing near. So let's pray. 
Dear Father in heaven, thank you that I can be here. Thank you that we are all here. Thank you that we are recording these programs or this program and we, or this message really, it's not a program, it's a message from your word. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to us. Speak to our hearts, dear God, in a way that only you can. And bless us and, and help us to realize the times in which we live and that Jesus is coming soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well that was really an introduction to my talk, Climate Change and the Mark of the Beast. And now I'm going to push my button on my computer here and I'm going to do something that I rarely do. And that is I'm going to show you about a four and a half minute video. Okay, so I hardly ever do that during church. But I'm going to do that right now because... I think this is significant and what you're about to see is kind of is just an overview of uh, what people are thinking when it comes to the topic of climate change. So here we go. We're in the middle of a vast ecological emergency. We're looking at starvation. I mean, think about that. Wildfires in the Arctic. It's not going to be too long until it comes for everybody. You can't sort this one out by being the world's best recycler or taking shorter showers. I'm afraid the sort of traditional methods of campaigning that we've been using haven't kind of delivered that sense of urgency yet. So what Extinction Rebellion is doing is creating disruption in society so that people start attending to the issue. It is a peaceful, non-violent movement for civil disobedience. The best thing I could do was to be out there demanding radical change. Extinction Rebellion's entire focus is about reweaving the 100%, the whole human family. This is not even about future generations anymore. This is about us and whether we get to have a future. We need everyone's hands on deck and bodies on the line in order to stop these catastrophic possibilities from coming to fruition. Climate change is happening faster than even scientists had thought possible. Scorching heat waves, ferocious storms, torrential downpours. This is the issue of our time. There will be climate refugees, even here in Britain. Nothing like this has ever happened before. We're evidently chapter one. Today, Mr Speaker, this House must declare an environment and climate emergency. We have no time to waste. We are living in a climate crisis that will spiral dangerously out of control unless we take rapid and dramatic action now. This is no longer about a distant future. <clears throat> We're talking about nothing less than the irreversible destruction of the environment within our lifetimes of members of this House. Young people know this. They have the most to lose. I was, like many members of this House on all sides, deeply moved a few weeks ago to see the streets outside this Parliament filled with colour and noise by children 
chanting, our planet, our future. For someone of my generation, it was inspiring, but also humbling that children felt they had to leave school to teach us adults a lesson. The truth is, they are ahead of the politicians on this the most important issue of our time. We are witnessing an unprecedented upsurge of climate activism with groups like Extinction Rebellion forcing the politicians in this building to listen. For all the dismissive and defensive column inches the processes have provoked, they are a massive and I believe very necessary wake-up call. Today we have the opportunity to say we hear you. I don't know if you caught what he said at the very end, that uh, the, the protesters are forcing the politicians to listen and to act. Now, what you just saw is, is like I said, basically an overview of the climate change movement, which is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I can hardly go on to any news app that I have and not see something about climate change when I check the news. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's gigantic. I'm writing a book on this right now. I'm continuing to do, to do my research. Uh, there have been thousands and thousands of people all around the world that have been flooding into cities and protesting. Uh, students have quit school for a day to go, on, to, go to different places and protest. Uh, Basically, what's happening is that the world is falling apart. We can see that. Environmentally, we are surrounded by disasters like hurricanes, fires, floods, storms. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are happening. And people are looking at these things and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And they've come, many scientists, and I'm not here really to debate the science, but many scientists have come to the conclusion that what's happening is that because of so much uh, industrialization and manufacturing and our reliance as, as a human race, on what's called fossil fuels, which are coal and oil and natural gas, because we're relying on fossil fuels to power our civilization, they're saying that these fossil fuels are, the production of them are resulting in e emissions that are going up into the environment. They call them greenhouse emissions or carbon emissions. And they say that carbon dioxide is probably one of the worst. And the carbon dioxide keeps going up. And then they're saying that what's happening is uh, somehow that carbon dioxide and those greenhouse emissions, when they get up into the atmosphere, they block a lot of the heat that is on this planet from getting out, from getting up into the outer space and just dissipating. So they're saying that the result of all these carbon emissions up in the environment are resulting in a, what they call a greenhouse effect and that the planet is warming up. Have you, have you heard of global warming? So they're saying that global warming and, the, and a heating planet and a heating ocean and all these different things that are happening are resulting in more fires, more droughts, more hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera. And, there, and so basically what's happening is uh, there are thousands of scientists who have come to this, this same conclusion. And they are telling people, and the media is telling people, and the climate change movement is telling people that if our governments don't do something quickly and pass laws to limit the amount of fossil fuel use that this planet is using and go in a different direction, uh, such as green energy, solar energy, wind-powered, water-powered, that's not going to send up all those greenhouse gases up in the environment, 
if we don't as a planet all work together and start doing something quickly they're saying we only have you know maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years left as a planet uh, everything is just gonna is gonna implode and life is going to potentially become uh, un un you know this planet can become uninhabitable and so as a result of that people are scared there's a lot of kids that are scared scientists are scared uh, and so the pressure is mounting upon the governments of the world to do something and that's where that clipping I showed you where the man at the end said basically you know thank you for forcing us to listen and to take action that's basically what's going on now uh, as as this movement continues to grow just about every disaster you see these days is attributed to climate change you've heard about all the fires in california i grew up in california grew up in los angeles i still have some family members in california and every time i hear about some new fire whether it's the getty fire or the easy fire or the 46 fire or you know whatever these fires are i kind of look on the map and and hope that they're not near my sister <laughs> or you know, somebody else, my stepmother, who are still there. Here's a, a clip that I just took recently, and there it's a news clip. It says, now fueled by climate change, California's raging wildfires are threatening vulner com vulnerable communities first. So you can see there, you know, they're blaming the fires in California on climate change. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but this weekend, they're having huge flooding in Venice. Have you heard about that? Some of you have. It's a, one of the top news stories. Uh, Venice is a, is a coastal town in Italy, and, the, and they're used to water. But they're getting more water now than they've been getting uh, in the past. And so here's the headline here. Venice mayor blames climate change for the worst floods in over 50 years. And the date on that is November 13, 2019. The worst, flood to hit to, worst flooding to hit Venice in over 50 years is a direct result of climate change, says the mayor of the city. So I'm just using these as examples to show you, and the video as an example to show you that there's no doubt that there, there is a big movement in this world that's concerned about climate change. And, and again, I'm not here to really debate the science. You know, there are uh, many in our churches that believe in the science. They think it's, it's real. And then there are others that don't believe it at all. And uh, my conviction is that whether the science is right or not, we know that these things are happening. We know that Venice is, <laughs> under a lot of water. We know that there are fires that are raging in California. We know that there are big storms uh, that, are, that are hitting and hurricanes. We know that you know, the list just goes on and on and on of the things that are happening in this world. And we know that these are being attributed to climate change. Oh, here's another one of the Venice clips. Venice is underwater, and it's a preview of what climate change will bring to coastal cities. That's another headline. Now, I want to show you a quotation from volume six of the testimonies, page 409, from some ancient writings. Volume six, page 409 of the writings of Ellen White. She wrote over 100 years ago, that the restraining spirit of God is even now being withdrawn from the world. Hurricanes, storms, tempests, fire and flood, disasters by sea and by land follow each other in quick succession. And that's true, isn't it? And this is what's happening more and more. So there, there's no doubt that disasters are occurring. Everybody agrees with that. Whether you agree or disagree with the climate change science, 
you know, if, whether this is because uh, we've got too much carbon in the environment or whether it isn't. The reality is it's happening. These things are happening. And, and then it says that science seeks to explain all these things. And that's what the climate change movement is doing. It's seeking to explain all these disasters by saying that the ultimate culprit is carbon dioxide, carbon emissions that are coming from humanity's use of, uh, of fossil fuels. Are you following me? That's what they're saying. That's their that's the theory of climate change science. And uh, the spirit of prophecy puts, you know, hits the nail on the head when she wrote that science is seeking to explain all these things, which is what they're trying to do. And then she says the signs are thickening around us, telling of the near approach of the Son of God are attributed to any other than the true cause. Now, you know, God does work through natural, natural means, and it's, we do know that we are polluting this planet. As we read the scripture reading, the first scripture reading, Jesus will come when, when man is destroying the earth. And we know that humanity is causing a lot of pollution on this planet. There's no question about that. Now, the, the climate change question is, is humanity's use of fossil fuels creating all these uh, ultimately global warming that's causing all these other disasters? And you know, if, if that's true, then my response would be God is simply using, using uh, humanity's error to bring about these conditions. But I, you know, I, like I said, I don't really wanna get into whether that's the real cause or not. But one thing we do know, and we know it from this quote, and we know it from the Bible, we know it from the Bible, is that what we see happening among the nations, we, Jesus said in Luke 21, 25, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. In other words, up there in the sky, upon the earth, there'd be distress of nations. We see that with perplexity. There's no way out. We see that. The sea and the waves roaring, that's happening. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. People are certainly doing that. They're scared of what they see coming upon the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then verse 27 says, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So Jesus in Luke 21, verses 25, 26, and 27, points to all these catastrophic things happening in the world as signs of what? It's, a, it's signs of his coming signs of his return so everybody agrees that the world is in trouble the disasters are happening the climate change movement says the problem is carbon emissions the bible says they're signs whether they are connected to carbon emissions or not the the bigger issue is that they're signs they're signs of the near approach of the Son of God. Amen. That's what we're told. We're told right here. And that, that is something people are not seeing. That's why they think if we all just work together and if governments will pass fossil fuel limiting legislation, if they'll do that quickly enough, we can solve this problem. Can humanity work together to stop the signs of the second coming? No. There's no way. These signs are gonna increase and ultimately the real problem and the reason why these things are happening is because of the world's sin. Because the world is in sin and God is getting ready to act 
and to get rid of sin. That's the real issue, and the world does not see that. They don't understand that, but that's what's happening. It says, men cannot discern the sentinel angels restraining the four winds that they shall not blow until the servants of God are sealed. But when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. And that's from Revelation chapter 7, where the angels are holding the winds. Hold, hold, hold the winds. And as the winds are finally let loose and everything changes, I tell you, the real ultimate uh, enemy in the midst of all this is not carbon dioxide. It's, it's sin and the devil. <clears throat> and God will be allowing these things to happen in the days ahead. Now let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about the papal power. On the screen you see a picture of Pope Francis and what's called his, his encyclical. It's called, it's the, this is Latin, Laudato Si, which means blessed be or praise be. And this uh, Encyclical is an encyclical that was released on June 18, 2015 by the Vatican. And it's on the care of our common home. It's all about the environment. An encyclical is a, is a circulating letter. And this is a circulating letter from the Roman Catholic Church from Pope Francis to the peoples of the world. And he's basically in his encyclical talking about the environment, He's talking about catastrophes. He's talking about global warming and climate change and what the whole world needs to do to come together to solve this problem. Which, as you can see, the world certainly recognizes as a problem, right? Fires in California, climate change. Waters rising in Venice, climate change. You know, whatever next major disaster hits, they're going to say climate change. This is the trend of our world, and Pope Francis is right in the thick of this. Right in the thick of it. So he came out with his encyclical on June 18, 2015. Here's an article in the New York Times. Pope Francis, in sweeping encyclical, calls for swift action on climate change. It came out of the Vatican, and he talks about how we all need to work together to confront climate change. We need swift and unified global action. So Pope Francis is sort of positioning himself as the man with the answer to the climate change problem, which is supposedly causing all of these disasters. Following me? Okay. Uh, president Obama, when he was still president, he was president at the time when the encyclical came out. June 18, 2015, on the same day that the Pope's encyclical came out, the White House issued for immediate release a PR statement. And it came from the president. And this is what President Obama said about Pope Francis' encyclical. I welcome His Holiness Pope Francis' encyclical. And I deeply admire the Pope's decision to make the case. Clearly, powerfully, and with the full moral authority of his position for action on global climate change. And then he said, I believe that the United States must be a leader in this effort. So here he's saying, Pope Francis, I hear you. I appreciate your encyclical. I think you're right on target when it comes to solving climate change and how we all need to work together. And as the leader of the United States of America, President Obama is basically saying, America must act to, to lead out to help implement what's in the Pope's encyclical. 
That's what he's basically saying here. Now, our new president, President Trump, doesn't quite share President Obama's convictions. Uh, he does not agree with this whole climate change science, and he doesn't agree that we should you know, dedicate our whole lives to trying to uh, stop carbon dioxide from going up into the environment. But anyway, that's another story. Now, here's, here's where I'm going with this. Pope Francis, in his encyclical, for some strange reason, he brought right into the mixture of this whole thing, in the mixture of climate change and the environment and global warming and his proposed package of solutions to the problem, Pope Francis says Sunday and keeping Sunday is part of a global solution. He brings us right in section 237 of his encyclical. He said Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. So in Francis's mind, he's thinking if we all kept Sunday, this would be a, this would help to heal the planet and the problems that we have of climate change. That's his philosophy. And he's not the only one that is getting a hold of this philosophy. Uh, here's an article that appeared in The Guardian. Very significant art article. And the title is called Slow Sunday, The Simple Solution to Global Warming. Now how in the world can Sunday solve global warming? Using Sunday as a day of rest and renewal would be good for our personal health as well as the health of the planet. You can Google this and you can read this whole article and it's just fascinating to read this and, and, and read the argument. You know, the basic idea is imagine what would happen if all the businesses and all the stores and all the factories all around the world were all closed on Sunday. Just imagine. Uh, and people then could go to church. They wouldn't have to work. And if all these factories and businesses and stores all around the world were closed on Sunday, we could call uh, Sunday a carbon-free day. And so think of all the fossil fuels that wouldn't be burning from those factories on Sunday. Think of how many uh, carbon emissions would not be going up into the environment one day a week. Think of how that would help let more heat out <laughs> instead of it being trapped down here. And think how that would start counteracting global warming. See, the heating up of the planet. And if keeping Sunday one day a week all over the world, you know, started making a dent in global warming, then that would help with, there'd be less fires in California. There would be fewer cities underwater like Venice. There would be fewer hurricanes. There'd be fewer tornadoes. Uh, maybe, who knows, maybe there'd be less earthquakes. And the list just goes on and on and on of all the benefits that would come to humanity if we all kept Sunday. Are you following me? This is the, re this is the reasoning that is, that is growing. And now look at this quotation from The Great Controversy. In the book, The Great Controversy, it says, political corruption is destroying the love of justice and the regard for truth. And rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Now, if you take, if you take Sunday out of that equation, just for a minute, what you're looking at 
is, the, is a description of the climate change movement. The climate change movement is a movement that is pressuring rulers and legislators, like that clip I showed you, where that man said, thank you for forcing us to listen and to act now. And that's what the whole climate change movement is all about, is pressuring rulers and legislators to pass laws to help to solve the climate change problem. But the problem, a bigger problem, or one of the problems, is that Pope Francis and the Roman Catholic Church have a lot to do with this climate change movement. And inside of Pope Francis's, you could almost call it the Bible of the climate change movement, which is his encyclical, when he was in Washington, D.C., and he spoke in 2015 to a joint session of, of Congress, remember that? He quoted nine times from his encyclical. His, his encyclical is his baby. This is his mission. And inside of his thinking and inside of his encyclical, a major part of the solution to this problem is keeping Sunday. And all that needs to happen is if there's a few more disasters and things start really heating up, it would be very, very easy for this movement that's seeking to pressure rulers to pass laws to help stop climate change, it would be very easy for this movement to then pressure those same legislators and those same rulers to pass a law enforcing the keeping of Sunday as part of the solution to counteracting global warming. Are you following me? We're told that that's the kind of thing that we're going to be seeing. We're going to be seeing a grassroots movement putting pressure on rulers to pass laws. On page 590 of the Great Controversy, it will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath and that this sin has brought the calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. Now this tells me that there's going to be a shift that's going to take place. Right now, they're saying that the problem is carbon dioxide. And Sunday's part of the solution. But as the disasters increase, and that's what I expect. I hate, you know, I hate to say it. <laughs> Sometimes I say to, to uh, audience, I say, uh, I've got bad news and I've got good news. Do you, which one do you want first? And then I say, okay, all right, uh, the, I'll give you the bad news. The bad news is things are going to get worse than they are now. That's the bad news. I hate to tell you that, you know, but that's the reality. But the good news is that even though things are going to get worse, eventually uh, it's going to stop. And then things are going to get really good. In fact, they're going to be so good that we're not even going to remember the times that were bad. God has a bright future ahead of us. And it's going to be so bright and so good and so happy and so full of love and goodness that the bad's not even going to be remembered. But we're not there yet. And the reality is that things are going to get worse. And, and this is my, my conviction is that as disasters increase, as, and as Sunday is seen as being part of the solution to the climate change problem, and as disasters increase, then people are going to look at those disasters and they're going to say, this is not just a carbon dioxide problem. God is involved in this. That's what they're going to say. They're going to say, God is involved in this, and he wants us to keep Sunday as part of the solution to global warming. We need to go back to Sunday 
we need to come back to church on Sunday, and that's the direction that we're going, we're going in. And I tell you, we can see the writing on the wall. I mean, you know, these statements a uh, hundred years ago don't, don't make the kind of sense that they make right now. We can see all of this happening right in front of our eyes. The writing is on the wall, as they say. Now, on top of that, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but there have been multiple major news agencies mainstream agencies that have recently been reporting on the importance of getting back to Sunday. So it's not just Pope Francis. Uh, and here's just, a, here's just a few of them. This is one from the Pope, but it was reported in the Associated Press. Keeping stores open on Sunday is not beneficial for society, says Pope Francis. So Francis says, you know, if you really want to help society, we got to close those doors on Sunday. Here's another one from Time Magazine. On the seventh day, we rested. It talks about blue laws. The blue laws and how the blue laws were really a gift as much as a duty, a command to relax and reflect. So Sunday worship, Sunday football, Sunday paper, Sunday brunch. Sunday is a day to call your mom. We need to get back to Sunday. That's Time Magazine. Fox News. Let's make Sunday a day of rest, for God's sake. ABC News talks about how Sunday laws have been enforced recently in Germany. Here's CNN talking about quoting a senator from Arizona saying that we need to be talking about laws requiring people to go to church on Sunday. That's what that article was about. So we can see it over and over and over again. The climate change movement is here. The encyclical is here. Sunday's in the middle of the encyclical and pressure is building from the Guardian and from news organizations that we need to get back to Sunday. Making sense? Now look at this. This is another statement from The Great Controversy, page 605. It says, heretofore or prior to this time, those who have presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. In other words, those who have been preaching from the Bible, and we don't really have time right now to get into the whole of the third angel's message in Revelation 14, verses 9 to 12 that talk about the Ten Commandments, the beast, the image, and the mark. But this statement says that there was a time when people who said, you know, that religious liberty is going to disappear, that church and state are going to unite, that there's going to be something as a Sunday law in America, people have thought this is just crazy. This can't happen in our country. But then it says here, but as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching, then the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. Some people say to me, they say, Steve, how close do you think we are to Sunday laws? And my response is when I see it being debated in the news, on, on national television, then I'll know that we're getting very close. And we can see the build-up right now. That's my point. The build-up is, you know, the, it's like the rumbling. You know, if this uh, pulpit could make some sound, you would hear the, the rumbling, right? The rumbling is, is happening right now. The footsteps are approaching. It is being discussed in the news. It is in the midst of the encyclical. It is being promoted as a solution to global warming. All of this is happening, but we're not quite there yet. I think there's gonna be more disasters, more problems, and then the popular movement to pressure rulers is gonna really kick into force. And when that happens, then the subject is going to be widely agitated. And when it's widely agitated and seen to be approaching, 
then, then a number of things are going to happen. We're going to be tested. And we're going to be shifted, sifted. And we're going to be tried like never before. And those who are willing to stand for God and for the Bible and for the Ten Commandments and for the Seventh-day Sabbath as it's given to us in the Bible, those who are willing to do that will then receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a very powerful way so that we can give the final message to a lost world. That's what's going to happen. The third angel's, and the third angel's message is going to have an effect which it could never have before. Here's, a, here's a, a, an important thought. When, when the early rain fell, which was the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and then the latter rain is going to come during the final crisis. When the early rain fell, do you know why the preaching of, the, of Peter and the apostles was so powerful? The reason is because not only was the Holy Spirit there, but because Jesus had just suffered and died and been raised from the dead. And that was an event that was right in front of them that the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of and used to bring about the early rain and to help Christianity to spread around the world. And I see a similar thing at the end that the Holy Spirit is going to use an event that's happening right in front of people's eyes to speak to their hearts with great power one last time. And, and what is that event? It's the Sunday law. Exactly. It's the Sunday law as part of the solution to climate change and global warming. It's going to be forced Sunday and that is going to bring everybody in this world to the final test. And I don't really have time to go into all this right now. I'm going to wind this up pretty quick. But let me just uh, say this because this is very important. That when Sunday is enforced by law, and by the way, just for the record and for those who are watching on, on video, on YouTube or wherever, What's wrong with Sunday legislation anyway? Why is that wrong? I mean, a lot of people think, are going to think this is great. Hey, we're all going to you know, go back to church, spend time with your family, lessen global warming. So what's wrong with Sunday legislation? What's the first thing wrong with it? Force, right, good. It's using force. And God doesn't force people to obey him. Okay, what else is wrong with Sunday legislation? Against the commandments. Good, yes. It's, it's the wrong day. When you look at the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment says, remember the Sabbath day, which is the seventh day, not the first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose. So it's the wrong day, not in harmony with the Ten Commandments. Okay, a third reason is because historically... Uh, the popularity of Sunday is largely due to the Roman Catholic Church. And I'll show you a fourth reason in just, just a few moments. But anyway, when all of these things are happening, it's going to be God's time for his word to be heard. I don't think we're going to be quoting Great Controversy or Volume 6 of the Testimonies uh, when we're interviewed by reporters from CNN or from Fox News, or ABC, or NBC, or Associated Press. When they're interviewing us during the Sunday Law Crisis, saying, why are you Seventh-day Adventists not going along with the Sunday Law? Don't you want to help us solve global warming? Don't you want to stop these disasters from happening? Don't you want what's, what's uh, beneficial for the common good? What are we going to say? Well, we have to open our Bibles. We can show them the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And we ultimately need to go back to the, we need to go to the book of Revelation 
and we need to show them Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 12, which is the messages of the three angels, right there in Revelation. Three angels' messages that are given to the world right before Jesus comes. And when you look at these three angels' messages, and let me just tell you this briefly, just real quick, I'm going to give you a quick, quick, quick Bible study, and I'm going to tell you exactly what to do when the reporters are knocking on your door. You open your Bible, you go to Revelation chapter 14, and you show them that the first angel talks about worshiping the Creator of heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it. And then you show them that the third angel's message in verse 9 says don't worship the beast and get the mark. So you, you can say we want to be on the side of the Creator, not the beast, and we don't want the mark, the mark of the beast. And then you can show them that verse 12 says here are the saints who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Verse 12 talks about keeping God's law and following Jesus. And then tell them this. And I tell you, you'll, you know, the Holy Spirit will use you in a mighty way. Tell them this, that when you look at the Ten Commandments, when you look at the Ten Commandments, there's only one commandment about the Creator. And that's the one that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Only one. And then, if you really want to surprise a reporter or, or a pastor from another church, you know, many of whom are good people, a lot of these reporters are going to be, you know, their lives are in the balance because of what you say. They may join us a lot of pastors are going to join us from other churches. People are going to go out and others are going to come in. Right? Then, if you, then you can tell them that if you read the New Testament carefully and you can show them John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 3, you can show them that the real creator of heaven and earth is guess who? It's Jesus. The New Testament says that the one who died on the cross for our sins, who paid the price, who loves us, who gives hope to the hopeless, who loves us all, no matter how bad we've been, no matter how many commandments we've broken, no matter how messed up we are, no matter how many problems we have, the one who died on a cross to save us from sin and to forgive us and change our lives with his love is the same one that made the heavens and the earth. He's our creator. And therefore, the Sabbath belongs to him. The Sabbath is the day of Jesus Christ, Amen. the Lord of heaven and earth. And in the final hour, that is going to be the big, the big issue. Here's a statement from the Catholic Church that says, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change from Sabbath to Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. That came from Cardinal Gibbons, a very famous Catholic cardinal, November 11, 1895. So when the final issue hits, the ultimate choice is, are we gonna follow the, the Catholic Church, the beast of prophecy, and Sunday, which is a mark of its authority, being presented in the name of solving global warming uh, and, and helping with climate change? Or are we going to follow Jesus Christ? Are we going to follow the Bible? The Ten Commandments, Jesus Christ, our maker, the maker of heaven and earth, who gave his life on a cruel cross because he loves us to save us from sin.
You got it? That's the issue that the world will soon face, that it will soon face when Sunday is enforced by law. I'm almost done. John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's right. And that's what it's all about, ultimately. People are going to accuse us of being legalists. They're going to say, you know, you, you guys are a bunch of straight-laced legalists. But our response is, no, we're not. We're not legalists. We believe in love. You know, my wife is not here today. She's in Newport. But uh, if she was here, how important is it that I go home with just my wife and not with one of you other ladies? Somebody could say, oh, don't be a legalist. <laughs> you could take a different wife home. <laughs> What's, you know, one wife, another wife? <laughs> What's the difference? Well, you know the answer to that. It does make a difference which wife I'm with. I need to be with the one wife that's my wife. And my kids know that. Abby and Seth know that. Dad loves mom and mom loves dad. And they're married. And that's it. <laughs> it's the same way with the Sabbath. The seventh day is the Sabbath. It's not Sunday. It makes a difference. And the issue is an issue of love. Do we love Jesus and are we willing to stand for him? I heard a yes from a kid over here. Good. Very, very good. Revelation 14, verse 14, right after the three angels' messages, describes Jesus coming on a cloud with a sharp sickle. I looked and behold a white cloud. Our ministry is called White Horse Media. And we are looking forward to Jesus coming on a white cloud to come and gather his people in this world and to take us to a better place, to take us to a better land where there is no more pain or suffering or sorrow or diabetes or cancer or insomnia or uh, bad backs or whatever else is going on in people's lives. All that is going to be over. It's going to be gone. Well, here's my last slide. I'll just show you this before we have prayer. You probably have seen some of these before, but Whitehorse Media has a whole host of resources. We have a little pocketbook called The Antichrist Identified that explains who the beast is. Discovering the lost Sabbath truth, explaining what the Bible says about the Sabbath. Decoding the mark of the beast, explaining what Revelation 14, 9 is all about, about the mark of the beast. God's final warning, explaining the three angels' messages. The Pope and Prophecy is a little track. Startling Prophecies for America is a four-part DVD series. It's available for free on, on our YouTube channel. And then we have the Sunday Law Crisis, What You Need to Know. These are all resources that our churches should be stocked up on. Whether they're these or other resources that are similar, we should be stocked up because it's not going to be long until the disasters are going to increase and the climate change movement is going to shift gears and we're going to be in the midst of the final crisis, the Sunday law crisis, the mark of the beast crisis. Are you following me? And we need to get ready. We need to get ready now. Amen. We don't want to wait. Now's the time to get ready for Jesus to come. I hope you're ready for winter. Are you ready for winter? You got all your wood in your, in your barns? If you use wood to heat your house? Have you winterized your property? Are you ready? I hope so because it's it's upon us here in North Idaho. And it's the same way with Jesus coming and with the final crisis. So may the Lord help us to get Sunday law eyesed, just like winterized, mark of the beast eyesed, 
and to be grounded in the love and the mercy and the grace of Jesus our Savior. And then we'll be ready for whatever hits. Dear Father in heaven, we live in amazing times. We can see big things happening all around us. We see this huge climate change movement trying to solve all of these weather-related disasters. But Lord, they can't. This movement cannot solve these problems. There is no way out from an earthly solution. But there is a way out from heaven. Lord, you've told us that when these things begin to come to pass, you've told us to look up and lift up our heads because Jesus is getting ready to come back. Lord, that's what we want. And we pray that you'll bless this, uh, this talk. Use it on YouTube for whoever watches. May the Holy Spirit speak to all of our hearts and impress us that now is the time to surrender everything to the Savior, to come to the cross, to confess our sins, to receive your mercy and your forgiveness and your Holy Spirit power, to, to live for you and to do what's right. Bless us, Lord, and may we all be together when Jesus comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.